day. Who needs to go picture day? No. Life isn't always simple, but eating heart smart for American Heart Month is. Look for displays of heart healthy California walnuts at Jewel Osco. WTTW programming originates from the Renee Crown Public Media Center. I think he was a terrific father, sometimes. I think that he was a loving husband, sometimes. I think he was, like so many people, except this enormous talent. Hemingway is very complicated. I hate the myth of Hemingway. It obscures the man. And the man is much more interesting than the myth. Hey, bud, how's pajama day? Who needs school picture day? No. Life isn't always simple, but eating heart smart for American Heart Month is. Look for displays of heart healthy California walnuts at Jewel Osco. All jokes aside, was one of the first and most successful black-owned comedy clubs in the country. You couldn't just be black. You had to be funny and good. You know why they don't take black hostages, don't you? Because we're bad bargaining chips. What All Jokes Aside meant to the black comedian was an opportunity. You see, All Jokes Aside was a business, a funny business. Friday at 10.30 on WTTW. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by the generosity of the Lloyd A. Fry Foundation. Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Paris Schutz. And I'm Brandis Friedman. On the show tonight... He served as the inciter in chief. Our Spotlight Politics team breaks down the powerful video evidence used at today's impeachment trial and much more. A lot of families are food insecure. They're in trouble. That's my job. President Biden focuses on his COVID relief bill, but signals a minimum wage hike might not make the cut. How do we get back to some sense of normalcy for our children? Chicago Teachers Union members approve a deal to return to some in-person learning. The union's vice president joins us to discuss the agreement. Cancer or COPD or heart disease. Younger people with certain health concerns will soon be eligible to get the COVID vaccine, but not in Chicago. Debating the pros and cons over a new set of teaching standards from the Illinois State Board of Education. Aldermen want to boost the city's recycling rate, but is it that simple to do? I'm Angel Ito, and tonight I'll have a sneak peek on the new immersive Van Gogh exhibit. But first, some of today's top stories. Illinois' U.S. Senators are upping the pressure on President Joe Biden not to terminate John Lausch as U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois. In a letter to the White House, the Senators say, quote, We have made our position clear on Mr. Lausch's retention, both publicly and privately, including in direct conversations with the White House counsel as recently as last week. We reiterate today that John Lausch should be permitted to remain in place until the confirmation of his successor. Biden's acting attorney general asked for the resignations of nearly all U.S. attorneys, including Lausch, by February 28th. Illinois public health officials are reporting more than 2,800 new cases of COVID-19 and 53 additional deaths. That makes for a statewide total of more than 1.15 million cases and 19,739 deaths. And indoor dining and drinking is slowly coming back in Chicago and suburban Cook County. Starting Thursday and coinciding with Valentine's Day weekend, bars and restaurants will be permitted to seat 50 people or 25% capacity. That's up from a cap right now of 25 people. And Chicago is eligible via statewide rules to move to 50% capacity overall thanks to drastically improved COVID positivity numbers. But Mayor Lori Lightfoot and Chicago Public Health Commissioner Dr. Allison Arwadi say they want to keep around a few more restrictions to help drive that COVID rate even lower. If we can get down to moderate risk, that gets us back under 400 new cases per day. That, if you'll remember, has been our goal all along. This has not changed. 
And our Amanda Vinicky will have more on that later in the program. But first, to Brandis for the latest on the deal between Chicago teachers and CPS on in person learning. Brandis. Paris, thank you. Some Chicago public school students and staff will return to the classroom tomorrow after Chicago Teachers Union members approved a deal with the district to return to in-person learning. The agreement includes rules for suspending in-person learning based on the city's COVID-19 positivity rate and prioritizes vaccinations for employees working in person who have medically vulnerable people in their household. CPS parent Vanessa Chavez says she's glad there's a deal after weeks of sometimes tense negotiations. I've got four kids that are all e-learning and every single one of them is having a different reaction to, to this. And all four, it's, it's not positive. Safety in and of itself does not equal a complete elimination of risk. It's how do we take those risks and, and mitigate them and, and keep everyone as safe as possible. Joining us now is Chicago Teachers Union Vice President Stacy Davis Gates. Stacy, welcome back. You and I have talked about this quite a bit in these last few weeks and months. Uh, despite taking this agreement um, to your members, union leadership today, though, expressed disappointment with the deal, saying it's not what families and staff deserve. Why not? Stacy, I think you're muted. Of course, what a day. <laughs> Thank you for having me. Listen, 80% of our students will still be um, remote and the remote learning situation has not changed. Um, I think you heard our mayor and our CEO say very clearly that they do not intend to change that despite widespread student, parent, family, and educator pushback on that. Um, and that was a lot of what we were dealing with at the table is a lot of no, um, a lot of um, just no to things that we know aren't working, um, to you know things that we know we can do better and in partnership. But the word no was solid at the table um, for a very long time. About 68% of your members voted yes, 32% uh, voted no, with nearly 80% uh, of those eligible casting a vote. Are you concerned uh, that a significant portion of your membership uh, still has doubts about this plan? Well, what I would say is that a significant portion of our membership has experienced the Chicago Public Schools and the mayor and the mayor of the city demonize them, try and um, erect the narrative of parents against teachers, and that has long-lasting impact. They were treated unfairly for asking for basic safety standards. Um, our members give a lot to the city. They live in the city, and that um, no confidence vote that our delegates put through up this week as well is a is an indication of their dissatisfaction with being vilified through this process. Um, it was just unfair. It was unjust and completely unnecessary. Some members expressed concern about the 5,000 members who didn't vote, uh, believing that that is a high number of your 25,000 membership uh, union. Some also say that they had problems with their own ballots. Uh, does the union know what, if anything, went wrong? Well, what I would say, Brandis, is that um, there has been a high bar for participation in the Chicago Teachers Union. Um, if this bar was the bar for national elections, state elections, and local elections, we would probably have, you know, a more responsive leadership. I think that the turnout was above average. I think that the vote itself was above average. Uh, the parent that we heard from at the beginning of this segment, she also told us that she felt students and their families were caught in the middle of a political dispute between CTU and CPS. Uh, here's a little bit more of what she had to say. It made us understand that we had to take a very proactive role in advocating for our children. And, you know, as, as Mayor Lightfoot said, there's, you know, she doesn't want parents' voices or parents to feel like their voices are being drowned out and um, that hopefully there is a place for us at that table to start advocating for our children. Stacy, what's your reaction to that parent? Well, number one, um, I am a parent. I have three children who are in remote learning and have been since last March. Um, number two, the Chicago Teachers Union is pushing for a bigger table for all parents and stakeholders. It's called an elected school board. Our mayor has put a brick on that bill since being elected. So I absolutely agree with every parent that has spoken about the lack of access, the lack of voice, the lack of agency that they have. Again, parents have um, begged, especially our special education parents have begged for adjustments to remote learning. 
I think that the strategy um, of our mayor and of our school district is laid bare in this moment that they want to make remote learning as difficult as possible to drive families back into school buildings, even if they don't feel safe with doing that. Earlier tonight, CPS also held a town hall uh, updating families on the return to in-person learning. Here's a little bit of what Mayor Lightfoot said in that. Our schools are safe. And you don't have to just take my word for it. We had three weeks of proven implementation and execution of a school safety plan when our pre-K and cluster students and teachers came back into our buildings. Three weeks of proven success. We are continuing to evaluate and look at more things that we can do, but we feel very confident that we have a very solid plan. Now, Stacey, you've expressed some misgivings about this plan and the, the negotiating process with the city and the district, but your members have approved it. Do you have confidence in this plan? Well, one, um, I think that the talking point that the mayor is making is just not satisfied by the data we have on hand. There have been over a thousand COVID incidents in the Chicago Public School that ticked up precipitously um, in the two weeks when students were back in the school buildings. Over 60 schools at that time had actual COVID cases there. There were, clus there were clusters at McCutcheon, at Hanson. So this concept of safe needs to be interrogated and redefined because if safe are COVID clusters, then I have the wrong definition of safe as well as many other parents. So I hope that there's further interrogation of what safe means and how they intend to keep all of the stakeholders safe within our school buildings. And Stacey, before we let you go, our condolences on uh, the loss of uh, President Emerita Karen Lewis, uh, who we learned died a couple of days ago uh, after a long battle with brain cancer. Uh, the union hosted a virtual memorial and shiva for her tonight. What did Karen Lewis mean to you? <laughs> um, Brenda, you don't have enough time. <laughs> Big um, question. <laughs> I, um, I get an opportunity to interface with the world and fight for the equity and justice um, for black people, for brown people, for working class people um, in the city and across the country because Karen Lewis did it first. She didn't mince words, she fought power and she won. Um, she was able to transform the political landscape and ignite a red for ed movement that um, has reached every coast of this country. Um, she means a lot to me personally. Um, Karen trusted me mentored me. She loved me. She allowed me to grow. She allowed me to make mistakes. You can't have a better example of a black woman, of any woman, of any person leading with courage, conviction, and authenticity. May she rest in peace. Uh, Stacey Davis Gates, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And now to Paris and a look at the president's COVID relief proposal. Paris. Brandis, President Joe Biden's $1.9 trillion COVID relief plan is advancing through Congress, likely without support from Republicans. The president has stood firm on the size of the relief deal, including the $1,400 direct payments to individuals. But will it be enough to put the economic crisis brought on by the coronavirus behind us? And joining us now with more is Austin Goolsby, economics professor at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. He previously served in the White House as the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors and a member of President Barack Obama's cabinet. Austin Goolsby, welcome back to Chicago tonight. Hi, Barris. Thanks for having me again. All right, so we've got a graphic that lays out the main components of this $1.9 trillion package, $400 billion for pandemic response, so that's vaccination and reopening schools, a trillion dollars for those direct relief payments uh, in the form of $1,400 checks, and then there's also $440 billion in support for small business, and then $30, $350 billion for uh, state and local governments. So first question to you, Austin, is this the right size, and is it targeted the, the correct way? I think mostly, I mean, we, we can argue about the, the direct checks are about 25% of the total. There are other forms of direct assistance like unemployment money for, for the unemployed and, and others that are counting in, the, in, the, in that big number. I think we've multiple times made the mistake dealing with the virus of saying, well, let's wait and see if it's needed. And I've said that's the worst thing you can do in a pandemic, because by the time you realize it's needed, it's too late. The thing has already spread. As goes the virus, so goes the economy. So hopefully 
a, six months, a year from now, the vaccine's widely available, we've gotten control of the virus, and, and we can tamp down the problems in the economy. But until that happens, we're still kind of holding our breath. You saw the Fed today say that they believe that the accurate representation unemployment rate is over 10% which is as bad as it ever was in the Great Recession. Right. So I and that, think that, that's big is for, better and sooner is better. That's accounting for some possible mistakes. Where The official number was closer to 6%. Um, so what about your former colleague, Lawrence Summers, saying, well, the flip side of this, if it's big, uh, it could lead to inflationary pressures? I guess I would just say two things about it. One, the predicting that we shouldn't do things because there's going to be inflation uh, th there have been people saying that for 14 straight years. The Fed has been promising that they would get the inflation rate up to 2%, and they haven't been able to do that. So I would take a little bit with a grain of salt anybody who says that they have a model that predicts that there's imminent danger of inflation because the economy is about to overheat when the true unemployment rate is, it was, is at 10%. And I guess the second thing I'd say is a lot of the critics are using what I would consider stimulus mentality and kind of a old fashioned conventional business cycle is the way that they're thinking about what is in my mind, disaster relief money. And, and that's the wrong way to think of it. This isn't stimulus. We're not trying to juice the GDP growth rate we're trying to present, prevent people from getting thrown out of their homes, uh, businesses shutting down permanently, the kind of permanent damage that will happen if you don't help people hold their breath until the thing passes over us. And so I think on two counts, it was kind of a misdiagnosis. And I've noticed that supporters of the bill are, are uh, careful to call it the Recovery uh, Act and not a stimulus uh, for that reason. Let's hear what uh, President Joe Biden said about another possible component here, raising the minimum wage to $15. Apparently that's not going to occur because of the rules of the United States Senate. I put it in, but I don't think it's going to survive. So it might not survive this reconciliation package, although we've spoken with Democrats who still think there's a chance. Uh, the CBO came out with a score saying that if you did raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, it would actually uh, add a little bit to the deficit and cost 1.4 million jobs over a, a span of several years. Is, that, is this a dash of cold water on that idea? Maybe. I'm very familiar with the economic research about the employment impact, impact of, of the minimum wage. I will point out that the CBO's estimate is about two to four times bigger than than the consensus estimates that most economic researchers have in terms of, of the predicted job loss. And there was another side in the CBO report that said a million or so people would be pulled out of poverty and that on balance, it would enhance incomes at the bottom of the distribution, not make it worse. So. I don't know if it's cold water. It's certainly a talking point for the opponents. I think the president was being realistic when he said he, he thinks because of the rules it's not going to be. We, we are probably going to have a fight about raising the minimum wage and what's the right form and should it be different in different states and stuff like that. But it's probably not going to take place around this relief bill. I, I just think it's going to be a separate thing. And one of the things that, that appears to be in this bill is that $350 billion piece for state and local governments. Republicans almost unanimously were opposed uh, to that. But uh, according to some numbers released today, that could mean about $13 billion for Illinois governments, $7.5 billion to the state of Illinois, uh, $5.5 billion to local governments. So that would stand to reason that Chicago would probably see more than a billion you know, beyond uh, helping severely uh, uh, cash-strap budgets, uh, is there a, a stimulative effect economically to having uh, you know, healthy, <laughs> healthy municipal governments financially? Yeah, look, everyone knows th that there is an important component of that. I hope and I, I really I pray that they include the re kind of rescue and relief money to states and cities that they're talking about because this is a national thing. It's not like states or cities made choices 
that they now regret and they should have to live with their decisions. This is about the massive costs that have been landed upon states and cities coming from COVID and the federal response being inadequate. Uh, so I think on philosophical grounds, this is a natural national expense, not a state level expense. And as long as it's not tied, it, you want to tie it to the either the population or the impact of the disease rather than tie it to whether a state or a city is running a, a budget deficit. You don't have to be from Chicago or from Illinois to know that some money along these lines would be extremely helpful for them not having to lay off teachers and firefighters and police. I mean, uh, you've seen a, re a real rash of layoffs at the state and local level because of the money. Awesome. We only have we have only a couple seconds, but is is it too soon to start talking about the national debt? Uh, you know, it's it's a controversial topic. It's kind of been put under the radar for now. When do we start talking about that? It's not that it's too soon. It's that it's not appropriate to be talking about the national debt for something like this. This is exactly the kind of temporary national shock, like a war, like a natural disaster. This is exactly what national debt is for, so that you can spread out the costs. And, and so I, I don't think that we should be talking about how could we pay for this in this year's fiscal budget. That doesn't make sense. All right. Uh, our thanks to Austin Goolsby. We hope to have you on a lot to talk about this, and we appreciate yeah, you joining us tonight. Thank you. Even if some people who want it are struggling to get an appointment, Illinois is preparing to greatly expand the population eligible to receive a vaccine for the coronavirus. Amanda Vinicky joins us now with the latest. Amanda. There's actually a lot of COVID and vaccine updates today. For starters, Illinois just adding 100 more vaccination sites, bringing it to 517 across the state where folks who are eligible can get one of those shots in their arm. Still, not everybody is able to get to a coronavirus vaccination site. And places like Adams County are beginning to do at-home visits so that people who are most vulnerable, those who can't leave their homes, can get the vaccine. The mental component of what our society as a whole has gone through in the last year has been incredible. And this is one area where we uh, will hope to take a homebound population who's also been socially isolated and open the world back up to them just a little bit. And then there's that change in eligibility. Illinois is expanding who can get the coronavirus vaccine in the current 1B phase, previously limited to those who are over age 65 or who perform essential frontline, frontline essential business jobs. Starting February 25th, that list is going to be extended to individuals with disabilities and also younger folks with high risk medical conditions. Many of these individuals may already be eligible because they're 65 and over or they're in a covered profession. But those who are under 65 and live with comorbidities have an elevated risk of serious complications or even death if they contract COVID-19. So as quickly as we receive enough vaccine supply, we need to waste no time in protecting them. Now, the conditions are subject to change, but that list includes cancer, diabetes, heart conditions, obesity, and pregnancy. The news was met with hearty approval from advocates for the disabled who are pressing Illinois to be broad and inclusive in determining how to define what persons with disabilities actually means. Bear in mind, this is a state change. The city of Chicago's phases for vaccine eligibility are similar, but they are not totally aligned, Chicago is not making this change. Those with medical conditions who are younger than 65 must still wait until the city gets to phase 1C. Dr. Ellison already says Chicago simply doesn't have enough supply. Here in Chicago, if we add additional people right now to 1B, all we do is make it harder for the people who are already eligible to get that vaccine. And it would make it harder for us to get it to the people over 65. It would make it harder for us to get it into the hardest hit communities because it just dilutes the amount that's available. 
already says, of course, she would like for more people to be able to get the vaccine. And while the city is getting more doses than it had been, Chicago, she says, needs thousands more than the 6,000 doses it is receiving daily now. So that means that the timeline for 1C to begin is looking like about April. Meanwhile, Fewer COVID cases means that, as you heard from Paris earlier, Chicago and Cook County are easing up on indoor dining restrictions. We all want to be able to gather with friends and enjoy time together. We must adopt an approach that couples that desire for communication and connection with caution. We do not want to experience resurgences in infection, and we are glad to be able to loosen restrictions, but safely. Starting tomorrow, restaurants can seat either 25% capacity or 50 people, whichever is less. But in the near future, should trends continue in a positive way, they'll extend to 40% capacity and then eventually to 50% capacity allowed. That is the state limit. One of the things that I'm hearing from our business community, predictability into how to continue to open is essential and important. So today's announcement by Dr. Arwoody in terms of setting the, the, the tone and understanding how we're progressing gives our businesses the opportunity to actually plan ahead. Still, some restaurateurs are disappointed that, especially as we're looking into that typically high volume Valentine's Day weekend, that Chicago continues to be more strict than the state requires. Dr. Arwoody says it is because of metrics like new COVID cases that Chicago is still considered high risk. And that is honestly as safe, as quickly as it is safe uh, to move. So I hear, you know, all, I feel like all I do right now is sort of say, no, not yet, just wait. We're moving as quickly as we can and all the numbers are looking good. Meanwhile, the Illinois House was back in Springfield today, and for the first time since coronavirus last March, representatives were back in their capital chambers, meaning that, that it was also new speaker Chris Welch's first time in that role at the true House Speaker's podium. For social distancing reasons, the 118 representatives were not all at the floor at one time. Their main objective for being there? to make it easier to vote remotely in the future. We begin to get back into a more nor normal uh, legislating process where every week, seven days a week, we can be holding hearings uh, on uh, issues that are of interest to the people of Illinois. The rules, however, just allow for committees to meet and to vote digitally. Legislators will need to once again meet back in Springfield if they are going to pass a law that would allow them to pass other laws in the future via something like Zoom. Now, one other major change to those new House rules on, especially as we are coming off of the tenure of long-term House Speaker Illinois Mike Madigan, Term limits now for Illinois House Speaker of 10 years. Paris, back to you. And Amanda, that's something we're going to get into a little more in Spotlight Politics, and you'll rejoin us for that. Thank you so much. And up next, Vincent Van Gogh's artwork comes to life in a new exhibit, so stick around. What can you tell us about how Chicago small businesses are doing? These are more than just shopping centers for the community. They're gathering places where they maintain their culture. And we have much more ahead in the program, including, as Paris just mentioned, our Spotlight Politics team on former President Trump's second impeachment trial. But first, a long-awaited immersive Van Gogh exhibit has finally made its way to the U.S., and Chicago is the first stop on the tour. Arts correspondent Angel Edo has the very first look at this one-of-a-kind digital experience. Inside the Germania Club building stands a new exhibit. About 40 feet high and 150 feet long. Now the immersive experience is literally a feast for the eyes, feeding your appetite with Van Gogh's greatest work. 
with 90 million pixels projecting onto 500,000 cubic feet throughout the gallery, artistic director Massimiliano Sicardi says the immersive experience reimagines what flashed before Van Gogh's eyes in the final moments prior to his death. With more than 400 licensed images, visitors are able to see up close and personal every detail and brushstroke that went into some of his most recognized pieces, like sunflowers and the bedroom. Now the experiential entertainment is choreographed to a soundtrack created by Luca Longobardi. It features a mix of his original compositions and works from other artists meant to enhance the emotional experience. Each run plays for about 45 minutes on a loop, with digital circles marking the floor so that attendees are able to stay for as long as they like while practicing social distancing. And while this one-of-a-kind experience gives visitors an in-depth look at Van Gogh's work, Sicardi says he hopes it inspires people to visit more museums and appreciate art in its original form. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ito. The new immersive Van Gogh exhibit officially opens tomorrow at the Germania Club building in Old Town. And now, Paris, back to you. All right, Brandis, and still to come on Chicago tonight, aldermen and streets and sanitation, they say streets and sanitation needs to do a better job keeping recyclable items out of landfills. But is that job easy? The pros and cons over a new set of teaching standards from the Illinois State Board of Education. If they had found Speaker Pelosi, they would have killed her. Live the siege. When and our Spotlight Politics team involved. breaks down the powerful video used at today's impeachment trial and much more. But for some more of today's top stories, pleas from Illinois Senator for U.S. Attorney John Lausch to keep his job. Senators Dick Durbin and Tammy Duckworth penned a letter to the White House urging once again for President Biden to reconsider having Lausch resign at the end of the month. Lausch was appointed by former President Donald Trump and has overseen the widening probe into ComEd that has implicated former Illinois House Speaker Michael Madigan. The acting U.S. Attorney General asked for the resignations of all but two U.S. attorneys following standard practice for new presidential administrations. And Illinois public health officials are reporting more than 2,800 new cases of COVID-19 and 53 additional deaths. That makes for a statewide total of more than 1.15 million cases and 19,739 deaths. Chicago aldermen say they want to boost the city's recycling rate and keep recyclable items out of landfills, but the Department of Streets and Sanitation says it isn't that simple. WTTW News reporter Heather Sharon joins us now with more. Heather, it seems like the city can never really get this recycling thing right. Uh, what prompted today's hearing at City Council? Well, in December, Inspector General Joe Ferguson released an audit that showed that the city wasn't even trying to enforce its ordinance that requires landlords and commercial businesses to at least offer their tenants an ability to re to recycle. They even can't, the city's ticketing system wasn't even set up to issue citations. So the aldermen wanted answers on that, but they heard a very complicated story about why Chicago hasn't managed to recycle more than 9% of its trash in more than four years. It seems like we've been doing stories on this for years and years and years with the same results. Did any resolution come out of today's hearing? None. It's a very complicated issue. It involves the international market for recyclable goods like aluminum and paper. However, big changes could be on the horizon. A study, a comprehensive study of the city's recycling efforts is underway and should be completed later this spring. In addition, there are new contracts being reviewed by city officials for private firms to take over some of the city's recycling zones. The city has six zones. The city handles two 
private firms handle the rest, and we'll have to see if those new rules can burst, boost the bottom line. All right, Heather, it's always a work in progress with the uh, city's recycling program. Thank you so much. Thanks, Paris. And we'll see you in just a few minutes for Spotlight Politics. And you can read Heather's full story on our website. It's all at WTTW.com slash news. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Thanks, Paris. The Illinois State Board of Education is working on a new set of teaching standards for what it calls culturally sensitive and responsive teaching. The board says this move will create a learning environment where students from different backgrounds feel engaged and can succeed. However, critics say the standards could politicize the classroom. Joining us now with more are Dr. Jennifer Kermis, Executive Director of Teaching and Learning with the Illinois State Board of Education, and Ted Dabrowski, the President of WirePoints, an economic research and commentary organization. Thanks to you both for joining us. Jennifer, let's start with you, please. So how would these new standards work and why are they necessary? Thank you. Yes, you said it beautifully. These standards are about helping aspiring teachers to develop the skills to create learning environments where children from all different backgrounds and communities in Illinois can all feel included and engaged. They'll be implemented in our colleges of education, which prepare our aspiring leaders. Um, they are a supplement to the teaching standards that we already have, and they will help new teachers learn research-based best practices that will make their teaching of the core subjects like math, reading, science, that much more effective. Um, we know that culturally responsive teaching works because when students feel like they are understood and welcomed and included and when they can take what they're learning and apply it in the context of their community and to issues that they care about, they're more likely to succeed. So this is about the, the learning for the teachers um, and how they teach versus, you know, what is actually being taught in the classroom. Absolutely. This is absolutely the how and equipping our teachers with all the tools that they could possibly need to do the most good for the most kids. Now, Ted, in an article that you uh, wrote last week, you claimed that the standards, quote, encourage progressive viewpoints, but that part is no longer in the proposed standards. Do you still view the, the standards, though, as politicizing education? Yes, you know, it's, it's um, very, it's not, um, let me say it this way, it's easy to agree with everything Jennifer said, because, you know, we want our, our, our teachers to, to understand their kids in the classroom. We want them to, to be introspective about themselves and how they teach. Uh, but these new rules, they politicize uh, the classroom because what they do is they move uh, teachers away from teaching our kids how to think to tell them what to think. And that's where I think parents on, you know, of any, you know, on any political side should really be cautious about these new rules and then actually impose them strongly. Um, what it does is it creates rules that, that bring in uh, new theories, um, a lot of what we call critical race theory, and it basically creates a political litmus test for teachers and uh, I think it, it, it runs the risk of making our, our classrooms and our children political footballs from when, you know, from when the politics change from one side to the other. We don't, we don't need politics in our classrooms. Jennifer, what, what's your response to that? Well, I, I would just say that uh, this project actually was initiated uh, under the former administration. Um, we started this project in 2018. Um, and I would also say that the standards are intended to be the opposite of political. They're supposed to make schools more and not less inclusive of diverse viewpoints. They don't promote any particular way of thinking or believing uh, for students and certainly not uh, for teachers and certainly not for students, but rather they invite educators to be reflective about how their own experiences and backgrounds might impact their teaching, either in positive ways um, or in ways that, that they might need to really think about and make some intentional choices about how to best reach students who could be different from them. Ted, you've argued though that these standards could distract from what educators should actually be focusing on. How so? What, what do you believe they should be focusing on? Well, you know, we know that two thirds of, of kids in Illinois, if you look at the standards, English standards and uh, and math standards, two thirds of them don't meet requirements. So we have a massive, massive gap in, in just that basic math and English and science and things like that. The problem is, is that, um, you know, these new rules 
there's a lot of talk of activism. So it replaces, you know, it, it, it asks for activism instead of teaching English. It asks to teach social justice rather than science. And it really moves the kids away from, from what they should be doing, and that's learning. And, uh, you know, if you look at the language, and I think I, I really ask, you know, any parent to go look at the actual language that ISBE has put out in these rules. And you'll see that it's not, it's not the basic things that talks about systems of oppression that, that, that teachers must teach and educate around the fact that uh, our, our schools have systems of oppression. And, you know, that means that uh, a teacher may be telling some kids that they're victims, other kids they're oppressors, and that's not what we want in our classrooms. We want teachers to be, you know, uh, invoking, you know, each kid is special, is unique, and, and that they can do the best they can and to learn. Um, but if we turn into politics and start telling our kids that they're victims and oppressors, it absolutely goes the wrong way. Now, re research shows, and we've only got about a minute left, so I apologize, shows that having just one black teacher in grades three through five increases the high school graduation odds for black boys by 30 percent. Um, but the overwhelming majority of the state's teachers are white compared to the state's student population, which is just less than half white. Uh, Jennifer, how could implementing these standards improve the teacher retention rate in Illinois, ending a teacher shortage? Yeah, so we think that these standards will help all teachers to be more successful. And the primary way that we measure that is with student achievement. And, you know, so I'm glad that Ted brought up the, the distance that we are from, from meeting the standards. These new teaching standards, which are, again, standards for teachers, not for students, there is nothing in them about what the conversation in classrooms has to be that is still all at the local level this is about giving the teachers the skills to improve student learning to do better at meeting the standards for student achievement and, so and again should, these are stand go ahead sorry i was just going to say because we're out of time but we should also mention the joint committee on administrative rules is uh, scheduled to vote on this next week um, in 10 seconds, Jennifer, if they if they don't vote on them or if it does not pass, what happens? Well, actually, if they don't vote, it does pass. Uh, and we will work very closely with our institutions of higher education to make sure that they are implemented in the way that they're intended to benefit all students in Illinois. And that is where we'll have to leave it. My thanks to Jennifer Kermis and Ted Dabrowski for joining us. Thank you. Up next, our Spotlight Politics team tackles today's impeachment trial, but first, a look at the weather. Powerful video is shown in former President Donald Trump's second impeachment trial today as state lawmakers meet in Springfield. All that and much more with our Spotlight Politics team. Joining us again, Amanda Venicky, Heather Sharon, and Paris Schutz. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, so after yesterday's vote on whether it was constitutional to impeach a former president or not, the Senate said it was by a 56 to 44 vote. The impeachment managers started to make their case today. Take a look. Trump incited the January 6th attack, and when his mob overran and occupied the Senate and attacked the House and assaulted law enforcement, he watched it on TV like a reality show. He reveled in it, and he did nothing to help us as Commander-in-Chief. Instead, he served as the inciter-in-chief, sending tweets that only further incited the rampaging mob. Heather, can you sum up today's proceedings? Would, are, the, are Democrats making the case that this would not have happened uh, without Donald Trump? That's exactly what they tried to do. Um, and they did it with video that we had never seen before from what actually happened inside the Capitol. And I think the clip that will stick with most people is the sight of Officer Eugene Goodman, who we saw lead the, a group of rioters away from the Senate doors a few minutes before came across Mitt Romney, the senator from Utah and the foe of pres former President Trump. See, he walks by him as he's running toward the disturbance and you can see him say to, to Senator Romney, go back, go back, it, it's dangerous. And you see Mitt Romney start to run with one of his aides. That was a really, uh, just, a, uh, just a breathtaking moment. 
And there was also video of Vice President Mike Pence being escorted from the chamber just two minutes before President Trump went, sent a tweet saying that he had basically betrayed him and that he should face some sort of consequences. So it was really an emotional day. Um, but this is the, the House manager's case. We will get to hear from the president's defense attorneys um, in the coming days. And they will have a chance to rebut this evidence and to make their case that it's unconstitutional to convict a former president once he's left office. And Amanda, we heard uh, Republican Senator uh, Cassidy from Louisiana said yesterday that, quote, House managers did a better job and he did vote for the constitution constitutionality of impeaching the former president. Is it possible? Are they changing minds here? You know, um, I, I think on one hand, I, most of the American public, presumably, let alone, and, and among them, of course, are senators, uh, that have made their minds made up, watched as this all unfolded January 6th. And of course, elected officials, surely, maybe we don't believe that it should be first and foremost in their minds, but many have their own political futures that they are weighing as they make a decision like this. And perhaps that calculus changed for them, given that the president, uh, President Trump, former President Trump, is no longer in the White House. To a degree, they don't have the same sort of pressure with this vote were he still there. And so I, I do think that it is going to be, by and large, minds are made up. Then again, you have someone like um, Mitt Romney who, who sees that video for the first time. Um, colleagues uh, that, that, yeah, I, I mean, it is emotional, I think, for anybody per, to watch any American, particularly if the, the Capitol is your office building. And so perhaps a couple of, of minds may be swayed. I don't now, know. There, there were concerns that, you know, this, the confirmation hearings would be happening at the same time as the impeachment. Um, but it is happening. Merrick Garland uh, is scheduled to come before the Judiciary Committee on February 22nd when Illinois Senator Durbin is chairing. Um, how is this possible, Paris, when all the center senators are participating in the impeachment trial? Well, Brandon, they can walk and chew gum at the same time, but I think they anticipate that the impeachment trial will be over by then. It is kind of extraordinary because at that point it will be more than two months into this new term where the Democrats, by the tie-breaking vote of the vice president, have the, the one-vote majority in the Senate, and yet because of a dispute over power sharing, uh, uh, the Republican chairman, Lindsey Graham, stayed on as Judiciary Committee chairman and slow-walked the confirmation hearing of Merrick Garland. So it's taken a long time. And Senator Durbin now is going to oversee that. Durbin might also have outsized influence on the appointment of new U.S. attorneys. And it's pretty interesting that he and Duckworth, both Democrats, are urging Biden very publicly to not uh, have John Lausch, the U.S. attorney here, resign. You know, right in the middle of that big comment investigation. Pat Collins, the former AUSA last night, brought up the possibility that maybe Durbin will have uh, Pat Co uh, will have Lausch reapply uh, for that job. So. Doesn't seem like a done deal here in the Northern District quite yet. Yeah, a lot to keep an eye out for there. So switching to, to state politics, Amanda, good news potentially for Illinois workers that the governor is not predicting or not planning for an income tax increase in his budget plan. Well, that is his proposed budget, and it is not all that often that you see a governor's budget proposal actually get passed and come to fruition. So there is some thought that this could just be his, you know, not wanting to wear the jacket for that. And then once he lays out what he has repeatedly said will be painful cuts that you'll have legislators say, no, we don't want these cuts. And then comes in a tax increase potentially. Um, that, that, that certainly has to be brought up because remember, of course, this comes about after his proposal to move to a graduated income tax rate was resoundingly rejected by Illinois voters. And he said, his, his lieutenant governor anyway, was very vocal in saying that a tax increase will be coming should that fail, which again, it did. Something that you have to factor in, of course, however, is what money is going to be coming from the feds and what that might do to politically save Governor Pritzker, as well as save some money from the pockets of Illinois taxpayers. And Heather, there is a new state senator on the north side, but it is not who everybody thought it would be. First, how is that hat eaten coming along for you? And second, <laughs> who is Mike Simmons and what happened? <laughs> So I deserved that, but I was not alone in thinking you were that not. it was 
Kelly Cassidy to replace Heather Steens. Instead, it is Mike Simmons, who worked for former Mayor Rahm Emanuel and who was part of the Obama Foundation's My Brother's Keeper program. He is the first gay black representative of the north side of Chicago. And I think that he really represents a concerted effort among leaders. Now he was picked by committee people. So these are all sort of leading Democrats who are working to diversify the party and to sort of usher in a new era of Illinois politics where maybe the backroom deals aren't quite as backroomy or maybe the room's not quite as smoke filled. But he will also have to face the voters in a very short time. So he will have to hit the ground running. He has promised to be a more progressive vote on the north side. So he will be heading to Springfield to take some very tough votes because like Amanda just said, he might have to vote for a tax increase quickly after taking office. But so can, I just, can I jump in here? I'm sorry. So, and I think I was the one that said Simmons was making a charge last week and not, not to gloat or anything, um, but you know, this kind of follows this Illinois tradition of, of, a, of a state senator representing, uh, representative resigning right in the beginning of their term. So it's not the voters that are picking their representative. It's these political power brokers. Um, and so, you know, Senator Staines, we're not exactly sure why she resigned in the beginning of a term. Uh, now, Mr. Simmons will have to go face the voters eventually in four years. But this happens over and over and over in Illinois where someone resigns and it's not voters that choose their representative, it's, it's committee people. So moving on to, to COVID-19 news, Chicago's public health commissioner is pretty optimistic that more vaccines are on the way and expanding to phase 1C won't be delayed. Take a look. If we were to really not have gotten through a lot of our 1B population, it's possible we'd have to push it back. I'm continuing to feel pretty optimistic uh, that probably by March, we will be getting quite a bit more vaccine here. You know, Heather, Dr. Arwady says that mass vaccination sites are ready, uh, but they can't get more vaccines. What is happening to get more vaccines? Well, it is really up to the federal government. Um, the vaccines have to come from the federal government to the state of Illinois and then to the city of Chicago, which gets its own vaccine allotment. So it is, you know, Mayor Lightfoot and Dr. Arwady, they are really at the mercy of the Biden administration. And they would be able to handle tens of thousands of more doses of vaccine. They say they can open up those facilities and get them out into people's arms. But if the supply isn't there, the supply is just not there. And that is very, very frustrating for a lot of politicians because they're getting the same calls that I'm getting. How can I get a vaccine? Can you help me register? Uh, why can't I get a vaccine? Why can't my elderly mother who's got health problems get a vaccine so they're under a lot of pressure and they're trying to under promise and over deliver because nobody wants to say maybe by the end of March and then have it not be the end of March in Paris restaurants you know are opening uh, further to serve more customers why now well Valentine's Day I mean it's a big uh, money maker for restaurants they have all those three hundred dollar uh, prefix specials uh, drink specials whatever and and there it's really necessary for this industry that's just been just battered and bruised so you know the the head of the restaurant association Sam Toy has been working with this city saying please you know we got to relax restrictions here and I think she's she's listened to that you know just in time for this big weekend, although, you know, Chicago does qualify for 50% capacity right now because of its COVID rate, but the mayor says she wants to keep an additional level of restrictions. So 50 people will be the cap and 25% capacity. Okay, so a second uh, teacher strike in two years was averted this week. We're switching gears a little bit, guys. Um, Heather, briefly, because obviously I'd like for us to be able to talk about Karen Lewis, but Heather, when will students head back to the classroom? Well, Preschool students and some special education students head back tomorrow. Elementary school students will head back March 1st if you are in kindergarten through fifth grade, or if you're a sixth, seventh, or eighth grader, March 8th will be your first day if you have opted for in-person learning. So that is much later than the mayor wanted, but it is much sooner than the teachers union wanted because not all teachers will be able to be fully vaccinated by that point, although they will be sort of speeding up that effort to vaccinate teachers because that was a key demand of the union. Well, and you know what? Turns out we have more time than I thought we did. So Amanda, I'm going to come to you. <laughs> what happened? Uh, it, it was sort of an 11th hour. You know, it really looked like a lockout or a strike was in the offing. What happened to pull this together? You know, I, I really wish that I could be in those rooms and that I would be able to tell you the real story there, Brandis. But I think that um, what you had, frankly, was both sides 
not wanting to get to that point. There is massive frustration, I think, with Mayor Lightfoot, particularly by those who say that you are sending teachers back into classrooms way too early, that this is dangerous. Why are you the pressing the buttons? We are still in a pandemic. And then on the opposite side, of course, a whole lot of pressure saying, hey, wait, there have been plenty of people going back to work, essential workers, grocery store clerks, uh, daycare providers who haven't had the same sort of protections, access, ability to work remotely. And so I think both sides really, frankly, recognizing pressure and and, and giving some. It's, it's a compromise. In Paris this week, we know that uh, we just spoke with uh, Stacey Davis Gates at CTU about this. But, you know, Karen Lewis, former president of the Chicago Teachers Union, was a very large figure in Chicago politics. Talk a little bit about her, you know, her political aspirations um, and her what ended up becoming a friendship with former Mayor Rahm Emanuel. Well, I don't know if it was a friendship, but it was it was a lot. The relationship ended in a better place uh, uh, than where it started, where there was a lots of lots of FUs. But, you know, Brandon, you covered Karen Lewis really close for the last few years. She really is one of the most influential political figures in modern Chicago history. And I say that because, you know, Mayor Daley had unlimited power for 20-something years. When Mayor Emanuel came in, he had unlimited power. It looked like he was going to get to do whatever he wanted. Then he closes the, the schools, and the teachers go on strike. And this politically weakened Emanuel, and he never really recovered from that. And she became the center of the opposition, and the teachers' union became the, the centrifugal political force uh, opposed to more of that centrist corporate uh, uh, democratic philosophy and if you see the dominant political strain in city council today it really is that more progressive uh, populist pro-union uh, ideology and really Karen Lewis is the godmother of that far before uh, Bernie Sanders became a national figure she really is the vanguard of that movement in Chicago so she 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 was beyond her uh, influence on education an enormous political influence in Chicago absolutely Paris and you know just from my perspective because as you said I did cover her quite a bit you know the, the her last few years when she was still serving with the union when she first got there uh, she when she and core first came into uh, into leadership at CTU they spent a lot of time uh, organizing and supporting families so that they felt like they were the representative for not just their students but for their families and what those communities needed as well really changing uh, how things went down at the bargaining table between CPS and CTU. So may she rest in peace. And, and let's not forget what a, I mean, what a renaissance woman she was. Uh, she was. Spoke three languages, uh, brilliant in science, a brilliant teacher, and loved music. She liked to talk about Cole Porter and, and singing show tunes <laughs> she, and stuff She was a like lover that. of the humanities, and she was a chemistry teacher and as a chemistry well. Teacher. So renaissance right. woman is, is the best way to describe her. My thanks to our Spotlight Politics team, Amanda Benneke, Heather Sharon, and of course, Paris Schutz. And you can find much more on the stories discussed tonight on our website. And while you're there, make sure to check out our story about virtual celebrations for St. Patrick's Day, because it's never too early to start planning. It's all at WTTW.com slash news. And that's our show for this Wednesday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join us tomorrow night live at 7. Chinatown is the next stop on our In Your Neighborhood series, how the community is adapting Chinese New Year celebrations amid the pandemic. And the Chicago origins of a famous bicycle company in an all-new Ask Jeffrey. And we leave you tonight with more from the immersive Van Gogh exhibit that opens tomorrow. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris Schutz. I thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe and warm and have a great night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm, sponsoring a free continuing legal education program for over a decade for lawyers across the state.